But I think that, you know, even when there was a 10th month uh, settlement moratorium, they lost, they wasted nine months, the Palestinians, by not coming to the table. So you need to resolve the differences. There has to be a two-state solution to give dignity to both sides. Uh, I just don't think the UN is the way to do it. And I think if, if we look at how the Arab Spring has impacted Egypt, how it's led to more incendiary politics, um, and uh, I mentioned the embassy issue, and I looked at Ankara, um, I think the Palestinians have been impacted by the Arab Spring. Look, Abbas, for Abbas, his biggest patron was Hosni Mubarak. It wasn't just true for Abbas, to be fair, also Yasser Arafat. And he was there for 30 years, and now, poof, he's gone. So it's like the legs have been cut out from under you. And you wonder, and you may, you look at a Newsweek interview, he kind of said that he didn't like it that the U.S. pulled the rug out from under a bar because he saw it. Now, this is a very sensitive question, you know, but uh, I think that uh, it is what it is. I think he was looking for some political masterstroke that would capture the hearts, the minds, the imaginations of his own people that will say, this Arab Spring is not going to be directed against me. I'm going to lead the parade. I'm going to find some almost gimmick to, to, to get out from the back of the line and go to the front of the line. And that is going to the UN. Because that is not business as usual. That's drama. The whole world's going to watch. They're going to turn on Al Jazeera. They're going to turn on Al Arabiya. They're going to see me at the UN. And, you know, so I think if you look at one of the legacies is, is, is this week in the UN is directly connected to the Arab Spring. It's Abbas looking for a way uh, to lead the parade. At a, and, uh, at a time that his own advisors don't seem to like the idea. Prime Minister Fayyad has come out very skeptical of it. Some of the others have been skeptical. But he sees it as he's out there on, on the limb and uh, he's going for it. Now, what could happen as a result? And I don't want to talk too long, so I'm going to leave time for the Q&A. Um, you know, I think the expectation was that he would pivot in one of three directions. Pivot towards the General Assembly after, after this Friday and go for um, a UN General Assembly resolution that would lead to a dramatic vote. Um, I think the US and Europeans have been working together to reshape an alternative resolution. Uh, but so far he isn't doing that. Some said, well, he wants to push for a U.S. veto because then he could inflame people on the street, not towards violence, but just to get people enthusiastic about Palestinian statehood, but it could be at the expense of ties with the U.S. Uh, the third element is um, he could say, well, I've shown my political muscles by um, going to the Security Council, now I'm going to go to direct talk. And that's what the quartet would like him to do. That's the U.S., the European Union, Russia, the United Nations. And there's a formula for direct talks, largely based on the Obama speeches in May. And that was, you know, one of the pivot points. Right now, we don't see him pivoting in any of those three directions. Right now. Things could change between now and Friday, or next week. But it looks like the Security Council thing is going to be very, how should I say this, uh, anticlimactic that all these college students are going to turn on TV and say, well, I'm going to turn on CNN, I hear this is all coming to a head. Yeah, they're going to turn it on. He's going to give a speech, Netanyahu give a speech, and then nothing. Uh, because this thing could get ensnarled in the UN machinery at the Security Council. It's unclear that he has nine votes out of 15, but you need nine affirmative votes. Um, and, it's not just about countries like Britain and France and the United States, uh, but Germany also, which is on the Security Council this month, uh, but countries like Bosnia, uh, Gabon, Nigeria, uh, they're all players here. Uh, it seems to me, if I had to predict, he's, you know, he likes to use his words with me, and this is not my words, these are his. He said, I'm up the tree, and I wonder if he's up the tree on this issue that he feels that I gotta go forward, even though it's going into months of unknown wrangling over procedure, and I might not even come out of it with anything. Uh, I I was feeling he'd want to pivot quickly to the Security Council because you've got all these uh, foreign ministers and presidents and prime ministers and kings coming to the UN. This is the time of the year where there's the most attention. So we'll have to see. But I I. 
I, right now, I think it looks like a, an anticlimax. Uh, we'll see how it turns out. But I do think, in my view, and I'll just conclude with this, and then we'll open it up, is that the Arab Spring, to me, is one of the reasons why there needs to be uh, imperative for direct talks between Israel and Palestine. They, they're the only ones that can solve their own problems. <coughs> they have to work it out. And I don't think they can work out all the issues. I think some of the issues, I call them the narrative issues, Jerusalem and the refugees, it, the, the leaders have not uh, prepared the publics. And when they haven't prepared the publics, it usually doesn't work. I'll go back to sports. If you throw a desperate pass at football, it's called the Hail Mary pass. It never works. You know, you throw this long pass at the end of the game, it's either incomplete or an interception or uh, a sack quarterback. It never seems to work. You're better off throwing what I would call in football a screen pass, a shorter pass. Run the ball 70 yards. Have you scored? No. But you were, it's better to be on your own goal line, better to be right, you know, within field goal range. Uh, you still have some work ahead of you, but you've come a long way. And that's what I think these practical issues could be worked on. But, you know, I said to President Abbas that for you it's all about the land and the settlements, and I understand that, and I wrote, uh, I did some maps that the New York Times has just published online. If you go to NewYorkTimes.com and put in my name, you'll see the maps. And it's on, um, but, you know, I said to him, you see it's all about maps and land. And I understand that, I'm sympathetic. But you should understand that there's an alternative narrative. The Israelis feel it's not about land at all. They got out of the West Bank. I mean, they got out of Gaza, they got out of Lebanon, and they got thousands of rockets. And those rockets have meant that if you didn't like the movie, you know, the book in Gaza, you don't want to see the movie in the West Bank. And for them, they feel they're more insecure than secure. The whole idea of land for peace is to feel secure, not to feel vulnerable. And so you gotta realize as the Israelis see it, the narrative is not about land. It's about acceptance in the region. Uh, and then you have projectionist groups like Hamas and Hezbollah that don't accept this one the size of a telephone booth in Tel Aviv, let alone within what we call the pre-67 lines. So it seems to me that each side is that they have to cross a historic threshold. And uh, for you, it's about the land, but for the Israelis, it's about acceptance in this region. It's a Jewish state, it? but with equal rights for all citizens. And I think, sir, that if you don't cross that threshold, they won't cross that threshold. No one's going to do it alone. Each one's going to have to do it together. Uh, I think that's the hope. And uh, I think there's a chance of this, not to solve all the problems, but to solve the practical issues uh, that divide them. They can deal with the narrative issues later on, but, uh, but the, we need to build some trust that, that there's some hope here. If, if you add up, people say, you know, do you believe in two-state solution? Each side is about 65 to 70% say, yeah, they support it. Then you ask them a follow-up question. Does the other side want it? Oh, no, they don't want it. Then you're down to 30%. There's gut fears on each side. The Palestinians, it's about land. The Israelis, it's about acceptance. And I think you have to cross both of these historic thresholds. And to me, this is where we're at with the Arab Spring. Uh, there's a lot of long-term hope, but in the <laughs> short term, uh, the politics can be much more turbulent, and we just have to uh, keep our eye on the ball.